All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, hopefully, everyone has had, has had a pretty good week so far. A lot of sickness still going around. Lydia's at home sick this morning. Uh, she she texted about 7 saying she woke up with a fever and shakes and nausea and, and the whole bit. So, hopefully, it's not, you know, going around again in my family. Hopefully, maybe it'll be a little 24-hour deal. But pray for her. And you had a prayer request this morning. Doug? Uncle Glenn, uh... Thank you, suffered from alcohol poisoning last night. I was just wanting to keep in prayer and then I was full of cover. And maybe, uh, maybe he'll come to realization. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that'd be, for most of pretty powerful eye opener. Yeah, I wish it was all. Yeah, that's what took the words over. That's what I'm after. You know, I'm currently it's not over. Yeah. Pretty bad when it gets that bad on this side. Maybe that's yours. And for people, she's going on Wednesday to have a test done on her artery to keep their feet walking. Okay. Correct, Miss Gail. Uh, Bill and Glenda, they haven't been feeling well, and they need, they need to be in our prayers. Yeah, see if they can get back down. Let's keep praying for Brother Bill and Sister Glenda. I pray for uh, Mark and Sarah, Debbie's parents, that uh, God would just be with them and help them make better decisions. <coughs> you have a prayer request this morning. Everybody turn around and look how fancy Keith was looking this morning. Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> we were late because he was cramping. He was cramping? <laughs> 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 oh, he's in the bathroom all morning. I was looking at his hair. Mr. Cramp was right over there. <laughs> 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 Mr. Cramp was right over there. You can tell. <laughs> yeah, he had to lift yeah. down there. That's Cramp for me, boy. Did he brush his hair? Any other prayer requests this morning? Our usual for uh, Matthew and Daryl and the babies. Yeah, and Brant. And Brant. I, I sent a letter to Daryl, but I don't, I don't even know if he gets stuff until he's out of solitary. I, I don't know how that works. Yeah, he gets his mail. Okay, okay, good. Um, I'd like to, you know, keep Tyler in our prayers because. He has a really big opportunity right now in front of him. A really big band wants him. Mm. So um, if we could just pray about that, make sure it's the right decision for him to make. So. As long as it's not ACDC. Sorry, I spilled the, I spilled the beans, Tyler. I can't help it. <laughs> what band? No, they're called Born of Osiris. Huh? Born of Osiris. Cool. They're progressing. So we pray that God gives you wisdom. Brother Rick, would you mind opening our service in prayer? Well, Father God, we just come to you and we thank you for this time to come here and worship you, Lord, and write your word. We just pray over Josh that uh, he brings forth your word. Uh, and that we can teach every one of us, Lord. Pray over each and every one of your needs. Uh, we can't do everyone, but you can. You know each and every one of them. You know every person. You know every hair on their head. Lord, we just ask you to meet all these needs, Lord. And just be with us and guide us and protect us throughout this week. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you want to come up and sing in the choir this morning, <laughs> then we'll worship the Lord in song. Come on. <laughs>
Bless this offering for your service, Lord. Bless in your name, Jesus. Amen.
All right, this time we'll dismiss children to children's church. See there, honey. Here come you guys. Want to use your hat? Well, uh, we might need someone to, to be in nursery if anyone's able to, to be in nursery. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Are you guys excited about studying God's Word this morning? Oh, always excited about studying God's Word. One time not too long ago, there was this man that was walking down the street. He saw one of his closest friends just sobbing on the park bench. And they said, oh, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? And the man, oh, three weeks ago, my distant uncle died and left me $50,000 in the will. Oh, and the man said, well, I'm sorry, I, I, I guess. You got $50,000. He said, wait, it's not over yet. Two weeks ago, a cousin that I never met left me $95,000 and it's tax-free income to boot. And the man said, well, I, I just, I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't see what the problem is. It's not over yet. Last week, I found an unused lottery ticket on the ground. I scratched it off, $2.5 million. Okay, now, what on earth are you whining about? The man was just sobbing. And finally, he said, well, stop sobbing long enough to say, this week, nothing, nothing. That was the punchline. <laughs> 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 I tell you what, I feel bad for that guy, don't you? This, this week, after those three weeks of good, nothing good happened to him. Isn't that, isn't that so sad? You know, I know that story is far-fetched, but there's a nugget of truth that I think resonates within us. You see, we live in the wealthiest nation that the world has ever known. We are able to communicate with people around the world in 1080p HD. We're able to drive in an hour which is a couple generations ago would have taken a full day, haven't we? I have a heat stroke anytime the sanctuary gets to 73 degrees. When a generation ago, they didn't even have air conditioning. How did they survive? We live in the most privileged time and the most privileged nation the world has ever known. And yet a recent Gallup poll found that only 42% of Americans were happy with what they had. And just to bring this a little bit closer to home, our neighbor to the northeast, Arkansas, was among the top five unhappiest states in the nation. I said, well, if I lived in Arkansas, too, I would be pretty unhappy. <laughs> and Texas and Missouri, one of the few things that we have in common is both of us uh, make fun of Arkansas. I, I guess Arkansas is not so bad. I mean, if, if you're a dentist, there's not much there for you to do. But, you know, for, uh, not, not that bad, I guess. But this morning, I want to show you from God's Word. I'm trying, guys. I'm trying with these jokes. I'm trying. This morning, from God's Word, we are finishing up our little book of Habakkuk. And last week, we tackled 16 verses in one day. This week, three little verses at the end of the book. That's all we've got left to cover. They are three power-packed little verses. Let's turn to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3. You might have to use your table of contents for this, but it's not an easy find. And this morning, we're reading verses 17 through 19. I'll give you a moment to turn there. No, it's, it's before the New Testament, so it's before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all those. Um, the, the easiest way to find it is to use the table of contents. It's a little bitty book near the end of the Old Testament. Okay, awesome. Just probably, probably about two pages in your Bible. Yes, thank you. Well, let's start in chapter 3, verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength 
and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places or the choir director on my stringed instruments. May God bless me in this word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would bless this time of studying your word. Lord, I pray that, um, that your message would go forth clearly, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be communicating truth on the hearts of your people. I ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So this week's passage is a lot simpler than last week's, isn't it? Last week's was a complex song. Um, where, where Habakkuk was, was referencing all these times in Israelite history when God stepped in and saved the day. What we have this week is, is it's Habakkuk's simple conclusion to that wonderful song. One of my favorite uh, radio preachers, J. Vernon McGee, said that the book of Habakkuk begins with a question mark, but it ends with an exclamation point. Think about the beginning of the book of Habakkuk. Think about all the questions that Habakkuk was asking. Lord! Why are you allowing the wicked to prosper? Why are you punishing the righteous? Why are you allowing the social injustice to happen? And then when God says, don't worry, Habakkuk, I've got a plan. The Chaldeans are going to come in, and they're going to come in and, and conquer your people and end this injustice. And then Habakkuk said, Lord, why are you using them? They're more wicked than we are. Lord, why? 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 And then Habakkuk remembers in chapter 3 all of the good things that God has done in history. And he concludes by saying, Lord, if you did that for them, then I have faith you're going to do it for us, too. And verses 17 through 19 are just the, the grand finale, the exclamation point at the end of the sentence, where Habakkuk says, I'm going to trust in God. You see, I think that we live in a nation that does not understand the word contentment. So few people are happy with the good things that God has given them. But here in the book of Habakkuk, we see that even when God gives us lemons, we can praise him for that. Amen. So I see here in these verses three simple principles. These are reflected on the back of your bulletin. Three simple principles for how we can be people that are content with what God has given us in life. Amen. The first principle of contentment is that contentment requires a choice. Contentment requires a choice. Look with me again at verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, for any society, but especially for an agrarian society, I think you can imagine how dire this situation is. He says that the fig trees may not blossom. And these days, and actually still today in the Middle East, figs are a major crop. It, they're, figs are their apples and oranges. If the fig trees don't blossom, what else does he say? The second thing he says is, there be no fruit on the vines. That's talking about grapes. For the Israelites, especially in Habakkuk's day, grapes were not only a major source of food, but in this day before preservation was possible, wine was one of their only drinks. Water and wine and, and maybe some milk occasionally. So if that's taken away, if the olives don't grow, and these days olive oil was a, kind of like their butter. It was a major ingredient in almost everything that you cooked. There's no olives. But that doesn't even matter because there's no, there's no fruit growing in the field. It's all about wheat. There's no bread. Because there's no wheat, the sheep, the cattle, they're starving to death. Habakkuk is predicting a very dire situation. And if you look back in history, shortly after the time of Habakkuk, this came true. History reveals, and the Bible reveals in 2 Kings 25, that Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem was up on this mountain. You couldn't just conquer Jerusalem with a brute force. Because as you're climbing up the mountain, people are just going to be raining arrows down on you. So what they did was they scattered their army all around the city, blocking in every trade route so nothing came in, nothing went out. The people that eat the food, they're trapped inside. The fields that grow the food, they're trapped outside. This siege went on for 18 months. And so the Bible says there was not a crumb of food left in Jerusalem. At this point, when the people are starving, no longer able to fight, 
Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar busted through the gates and there wasn't even a resistance. No one had the energy to stand up against them because they were literally starving to death. And this morning, as we think about our problems in life, for one minute, I don't want us to think that somehow our problems can be as bad as his. For one minute, I don't think that my problems in life are as bad as some of those, those children in Africa that you see on commercials. For one minute, I don't think that my plight as a Christian is anywhere near as rough as if I were a Christian in North Korea or Saudi Arabia. Praise God, as the way things stand right now, I'm probably not going to be executed for being a Christian. But in some countries, you are. But at the same time, even though I'm not saying we've got it as bad as some of those, there are some very serious trials that come our way, aren't they? Aren't there? Some very serious things that some of you are dealing with right now. And not for a minute do I want to pretend that's not important. So what would verse 17 look like if Habakkuk had had you in mind when he wrote it? Maybe he would say, Lord, even if, I never find a quality job. Lord, even if the bank forecloses on my house, <clears throat> even if we go to the doctor and I find out that my spouse has terminal cancer, Lord, even if this back pain never goes away, even if all of my children totally rebel against what I taught them about you, even if I'm abandoned by everyone that loves me, even if everything I love is taken away, maybe that's what it would look like if it was written today. And that is some pretty serious business. But before we go on, I want you to think about the life of Job. You guys are familiar with the story of Job? The Bible says that Job was one of the wealthiest men on the face of the planet. He had everything. He's also one of the godliest men on the face of the planet. Just a super God. But God allowed Satan to first off take away all of Job's possessions. Then Job's children were not righteous like he was. Satan was allowed to kill all of Job's children, his ten children. Then Satan was allowed to rob Job of his health. Not for him, but make up to where he was miserable. Job had everything going wrong in his life. I can't imagine what would happen if something happened to one of my little girls. It breaks my heart when they're sick. I can't imagine losing one. I can't imagine losing all of them. That's what happened to Job. Job, out of all people in the Bible, he had a reason to be discontent. He had some bad stuff going on in his life. But in my opinion, the key verse in the book of Job is Job 13, 15. Listen real close. This is what Job says. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. No matter what God brings about in my life, I am going to trust in him. Who else do we have? I happen to know that Sister Carrie's favorite hymn is It Is Well With My Soul. It happens to be one of my favorite hymns as well. If you do a little research into the story of that hymn, it was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. In the early 1870s, Horatio had four daughters and one son, his youngest son. And when his son was four years old, he tragically died of illness. Shortly after that, Horatio had all of his business. He, he was a pretty rich man. He had all of his business tied up in Chicago. And he lost everything in the great Chicago fire. So in an attempt to restart a new life, him and his family were going to move to Europe. They bought the boat tickets. But at the last minute, Horatio had business that kept him, uh, he had some, some business about his stuff that had burned down in Chicago. So he told his family, you go on without me. I'll be on the next ship over. As that ship was crossing the Atlantic, it collided with another ship. His wife survived. His four daughters drowned. His wife sent him a telegram, saved alone. It's just me. Horatio Spafford got on the quickest boat he could. And as he was going over the exact spot where his daughters had drowned, 
he penned the first verse of it as well with my soul. Let me read you the first verse of that hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He had lost everything, but he was able to say, it's well with my soul. So if you're here this morning, and you ask those questions, why, Lord, why are you allowing these things to happen? I hope you can take some encouragement from the first half of verse 18. Look at what it says. Yet I will exult in the Lord. Some of your versions have the word rejoice, some have the word exult. What that word in the Hebrew literally means is, it's the kind of joy that you cannot contain. It's the kind of joy that when you've got that sort of joy in your heart, it's going to bubble out. It's going to come out. You're going to be singing. You're going to be shouting the praises of God. So back to saying this, even if all these things happen, I am going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to sing his praises. But in that phrase, you know what the two most important words are, in my opinion? I will. You see, what I've become convinced of is that being content with what God gives you in life requires a conscious choice. You have a decision to make this morning. Are you going to be okay with whatever God gives you? Or are you going to be bitter? Are you going to be miserable? Job chose contentment. Horatio Spafford said, It is well with my soul. What is your choice this morning? Whatever God has given you, even if the figs don't blossom, even if the cattle die in the stall, are you content with what God has given you? It takes a choice, and I hope that you are choosing contentment. The second principle we see about contentment from the book of Habakkuk is that contentment recognizes God's blessing. Contentment recognizes God's blessing. Look at the second half of verse 18. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Simple, simple. And the New American Standard Version has the word rejoice. In some versions it says, I will take joy. Uh, one version even has exult for the second one and rejoice for the first one. But whatever your version says, we're talking about that verb there in the second line of verse 18. What does it mean? Well, in the original Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, the word originally meant to circle around, to, to, walk, to spin around and look around. Over time, the word took on the additional meaning of rejoicing. Can I make an assertion this morning? I don't think it's a coincidence that the same word means to look around and rejoice. Do you know why? Because I'm convinced that as Christians, all we need to do to rejoice is look around and see what God has given us. Amen. Talk about how I have a heat stroke when it's 73 degrees. I don't even realize it could be 85. It could be 90 degrees in here. So often, I'm, I'm convinced that the single greatest cause of unhappiness is a failure to acknowledge the good things that God has given us. Amen? Amen. And as Christians, we are called to recognize God's blessing. So I know that some of you in your lives are having some really tough trials going on right now. But as Christians... We need to realize that every breath, every day we live, every moment we get to be with a loved one, every year that we have the privilege of living in a free society, every step that doesn't cause us immense pain, everything is a gift from God. As Christians, we must abandon the, the Western mindset that we deserve everything, and anything less is a curse. And we must adopt the biblical mindset that I deserve nothing, but everything I have is a blessing from God. 
you know, Habakkuk, he gives us a very specific blessing that we can be so grateful for. Look at what he says at the end of verse 18. I will rejoice in the God of my, what? And the God of my salvation. Habakkuk wrote that 700 years before Jesus Christ walked on earth. I sure am glad that we, even more than Habakkuk, know what it means to be saved. My friends, if Jesus Christ has saved you from your sins, then no matter what trial you are going through, it pales in comparison to the unsurpassing joy of knowing Jesus Christ. It is well with my soul. I hope you can say that this morning. No matter what is going on, I hope you can stop and look around and rejoice at what God has given you. And my friends, if you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, then you've got some stuff to rejoice about. The third principle to contentment is that contentment rests on future hope. So we've seen how contentment requires a choice. Contentment recognizes God's blessings. And finally, contentment rests on future hope. Look at verse 19 with me. The Lord God is my strength, <coughs> and he has made my feet like hinds' feet, and makes me walk on high places. The Lord God is my strength. Those are three powerful phrases. Look at that first one. The Lord God is my strength. In the Bible, typically the word strength, it's actually a military term. It's, a, it's, a, it's another way of saying the army. The strength of a nation is in how big its army is that protects it. So what Habakkuk is saying is, Lord, the Chaldeans are surrounding us. Doom is sure, but Lord, you are my army. If God is our army, who can stand against us? Amen. Habakkuk also says that you've made my feet like the hind's feet. A hind is like the Israel version of the white-tailed deer. There was one time when I was uh, probably about 16 years old. I was, I was hunting behind my parents' house. I was, I was actually bow hunting. And um, I was sitting in a ground blind. And as it was getting close to dark, this buck came up about 30 yards away from me, within, within range of my bow. And in truth, it, it was probably a nice six point, but as I keep retelling the story, it's, it's become a perfectly typical 10 point monster. <laughs> a, a, a big deer. You, you guys tell fish stories. You know what I'm talking about. It's a big one. So it's standing there, it's getting close to dark, and I slowly, slowly stand up. I quietly put my arrow on the string. I gradually pull back the string aim my shot. And just as I'm about ready to get that gear, my arrow falls off the notch and crashes to the ground. Oh no. <laughs> that buck looked around and snorted and gracefully pranced off <laughs> in the distance. I tell you what, watching a deer prance off is at once a both frustrating and beautiful sight. If you've ever seen it, they are so graceful on their feet. The back of saying, God helps him do that. What Habakkuk is saying is, Lord, whatever enemy comes in my path, you help me escape like the deer. No matter what trial comes your way, Habakkuk <coughs> asserts that God will bring the victory someday. Thirdly, Habakkuk says that God helps me to walk on my high places, to tread on my high places. This is confusing because in the Old Testament, about 80% of the time, the word high places was a phrase that they referred to how on hilltops, the pagans would build shrines to their gods and make sacrifices up on the hilltop. They thought, well, if we're up on the hilltop and gods, the gods are in the sky, then we're going to be closer to them. Kind of, kind of a crazy notion, but that's what they were doing. So normally, the phrase high places is talking about these, these pagan sacrificial sites. But in this case, I don't think that's what Habakkuk's talking about. Habakkuk's not saying that he's going up there worshiping sacrifices or worshiping idols. What it's talking about here is here's another military phrase. The, the phrase, walk on high places, is talking about, um, well, if, if you've ever studied military strategy, one of the absolute most simple military strategies is take the high ground. Whoever is higher up in elevation is probably going to win. And what Habakkuk is saying is, Lord, when I am with you, I am always on the high ground. I always have the advantage. No matter what enemy marches my way, I have the advantage because I know you. I know 
you, God. And so what Habakkuk is saying through these three, three phrases, God is my army. God helps me to escape any troubles. God always gives me the advantage over my enemy. Habakkuk knows that no matter what trials look like today, no matter how dark the night is, victory is just around the corner. And so this morning, I challenge you, as you're thinking about being content with whatever God gives you in life, realize that there is something great on the horizon. And I am not preaching that ridiculous health and wealth gospel. I am not telling you that if you will be content with $1,000 today and give me 500 of it, then tomorrow you're going to have $2,000. As a matter of fact, sometimes if God sees that you're content with 1000 he might see whether or not you'd be content with 100 But what I can promise you is, I'm not going to promise you that God's going to give you victory tomorrow. I'm not going to promise you that God's going to give you victory next year. But if you know Jesus Christ, I can promise you that on the day you die, you will find life. Amen. And that is victory. Amen. So as we think about being content, we need to remember that contentment rests on the hope that, Lord, right now, this is the lot you have for me. But you have something much, much better in store. And so as we bring this sermon to a conclusion... I want to quickly make a distinction that we actually talked about yesterday in men's Bible study. Contentment is very different from complacency. Allow me to explain the difference. Contentment says, Lord, I will be okay with whatever you give me in life because everything is a blessing. Complacency says, Lord, I will be okay with whatever I give you. We should always be content with what God gives us. We should never be complacent with what we give God. But this morning, I challenge each and every one of you, even, even if you've done it a hundred times before, just make a declaration to God that, Lord, no matter what trials come my way, no matter how little or how much you give me, I will be joyous for everything you've given me. I will be thankful for each day. I will be thankful for each moment you give me to be with a loved one. I will thank you for everything, no matter how menial it may seem, because it is a gift from you. And so this morning, if you've got a case of the common greed, or you've got a case of the common unhappiness that is so prevalent in America, look around and see what God has given you. And don't stop there. Not only look around, but look forward to what he's promised to give you one day. But maybe you are here this morning, and all week uh, several, of us, several of us have been praying that if God wills, someone would trust in Jesus Christ this morning. Maybe you are here this morning, and maybe you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. I've been talking about hope. I've been talking about contentment. But my friends, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can't have hope. You can't have contentment. Those things, those things are only possible through Him. The Bible tells us that even though we have desperately sinned against God, even though the Bible says that if God is a judge, which He is, we stand before Him guilty, condemned, unclean. The Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. Even though those things are true about us, for some reason that I don't understand, Jesus Christ thought that we were worth dying for. He is God in the flesh. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, came down and took our place on a cross. I deserve death. In God's throne room, I deserve the death penalty in hell for what I've done against Him. But Jesus Christ paid my price for me. And He rose from the grave. And the Bible says that whoever will make Jesus their king, whoever will give Him their allegiance, whoever will follow Him, whoever will acknowledge Him as Savior will be justified. That means that now, when I stand before the throne of God, yeah, my sins are going to be there. But next to each one, it's going to say, paid in full. Paid in full. I deserve death and hell. But Jesus Christ took my place on the cross. <laughs> and now I am forgiven. You want real hope? You want real contentment in your life? Acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
So because Ms. Wandel was able to be here this morning, we're not going to have a normal altar call. But we are going to all, I'm going to ask everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. And let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your throne as a people who, Lord, maybe for the first time, Lord, is acknowledging how good you've been in our lives. Lord Jesus, I am so thankful for your rich blessings. I deserve none of it. But Lord, I am even more thankful that one day I will get to meet you face to face. You are the God of my salvation. You are my strength. And Lord, I cannot wait to be with you in heaven. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we would be a people of contentment. I pray that our joy, and I pray that our happiness of whatever you have given us, so I pray that that will be contagious, that the world around us would see the people of First Girl Baptist Church and say something is different about them. They have the same job that I have. Their car is older than mine. Their house is in rougher shape. Their bank account is smaller, and yet they are happy. And Lord, I pray on that day that they will realize the difference that Jesus Christ makes. And maybe if you're here this morning and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you say, Brother Josh, I would love to trust in Christ, but I just don't know what to say. I don't know what it means to be a Christian. The Bible says there are no magic words. The Bible says that whoever trusts in Christ will be saved. So if, if you don't know what to say, and, and if, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a prayer, and if you believe this prayer with all of your heart, then feel free to repeat it after me. And this is just a prayer of trusting that Jesus Christ is your King. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned against you. I know that I deserve hell. And I know that on my own, I'm hopeless. But I also know that Jesus died for me. I know that Jesus rose from the grave for me. And Lord, today, I make you the king of my life. Lord, please help me to live for you. Thank you so much, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would anyone be so brave to say, Brother Josh, I just trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior? members of the church, which I, I'm so excited about. But here's the downfall of that. The downfall is that it's, it's, uh, you have to be a member of the church to be serving in different positions. And so we're in a church with a, a constantly growing children's church program, a constantly growing nursery program, a church that as we grow, we need more people to jump on board and say, I want to help. Where can I help? And so here's what I'm challenging you to do. There are several of you here this morning that I absolutely know meet the qualifications to be a member. What does it mean to be a member? It means you've got to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it means you've got to be baptized. And if you've been saved and baptized and you basically agree with what we teach here, then I think you would make an excellent member of our church. And so what I'm challenging any of you to do that think that you might be interested in being a member, these Bible studies are on the front pew. It takes about 15, 20 minutes. It explains in full what it means to be a member of our church. It shows you verses in the Bible to explain what it means to be a part of a church. I ask you to fill this out. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a challenge that, that, uh, that on Easter Sunday, that's four weeks away. Easter's in March this year. It's crazy. Four weeks away is Easter. 
I'm going to make a challenge that anyone that would like to join the church do so on that day. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to notice who all takes these. These are right here on the front pew. If you would be interested in uniting with our church, uh, obviously if you come to the front doors, you are a part of our church family. You are. You don't, have to, you don't have to be a member to be a part of our church family. You are a part of our church family. But a member is like an official way of saying, you know, uh, this is my church. It just kind of makes it official. And if you are interested in doing that, saying this is my church, I encourage you to take one of these membership Bible studies. Talk to me about it. Talk to Brother Stoney about it. Talk to Brother Keith about it. And we would love to answer your questions. We would love to tell you about how wonderful it has been being a member of this church. Uh, last year, we had six people unite with the church on Easter. Uh, almost all of them are here today. The Johnson family joined, and the Hendersons also joined, but they're out of town this morning. How many of you are willing to step up and say, I'll join this Easter? I pray you consider it. That's all I'm asking. Pray about it, consider it. Even if you're not sure, go and take one to see what the Lord would have you do. Brother Stone, you have some announcements for us? Brother Keith, would you do it for me? Yeah. I'm sorry, Brother Sony, I forgot. That's uh, all right. Uh, all right. This side, I'll read on this side. Or all uh, of you can read, read all of it. All right. Let's see what's going on at the First Greenville Baptist Church. Uh, we got the Noah's Park Children Church. Okay, it's a congregational scene. I'm trying to take part in our great children's church program. He'll get rolling down. Okay, we still got women's Bible study on Tuesdays at 6 30. If any ladies want to partake in that, it'd be awesome. And uh, I guess y'all are doing y'all's uh, resolution for women? Like we did the men? They're, they're, a little, they're just a little bit slower than us. Yeah, we're a little slower than you guys. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, oh. Boom! Wow. That's awesome. And then we got the men's Bible study. We really need that to start going back. Yeah. That hard to blend a little bit. So, March. On Saturdays. Very rough. Greg's been doing good. He's been coming. Tyler? Tyler. Dougie. I was there this Sunday. <laughs> Where were you? But we really need that to start to grow a little bit. And we're studying Elijah, which is pretty awesome. So, and I am bringing the food, Josh, so okay, great. take care of that. All right, church news. Easter Sunday, like we were talking about, March 30th. Uh, I guess, do we need more candy, eggs? Or we, no eggs? one's brought in candy yet, which, which is fine. It's still four weeks away. Um, but you know, just keep keep that. You know, don't stress me out by all everyone bringing a bad day. You know, let's let's, let's get some candy. Yeah. Okay. Let's get some candy. I think we have enough eggs. I think. But if you want to bring us more eggs, that's fine. Awesome. You know, we'll just. And I tell you guys, on on Easter Sunday, we're, people are going to have to be sitting in the fellowship hall. That's my prayer. I think I think we're going to fill this church up. But that's going to happen when we pray. That's going to happen when we invite people. Uh, and so be, be praying that God is a huge thing on Easter. Exactly, that'd be awesome. Okay, we got uh, the zoo trip, which is March 12th. We need still more uh, people to volunteer and help with that. What, or yeah, that on? Uh, uh, that's Tuesday. Tuesday. And if it, if it comes down to it, and like a bunch of people say, well, I can go Thursday, but not Tuesday. Or Monday, but not Tuesday. Well, we can we can move it, but but I mean it, it is getting close. It's, it's this is next Tuesday, and yeah, we, we still need adults to go. Um, uh, Lydia and I actually have membership, and so does Naomi. So for each member, uh, six people get a three dollar discount. So up to eighteen people besides our family can get three dollars off. So that's why it's only uh, six dollars per kid and nine dollars per adult. Um, basically, our biggest need is just making sure we have enough people going that, that can drive. So making sure we have enough seats available to get there. Uh, so if, if you're interested in going, uh, please go and, and please also let me know so I don't have to stress out about it. And you're leaving at 9.30 a.m. back at 2. <coughs> and then we've got a brief, uh, brief meeting after tonight's Bible study. And make a decision on the Bible, I guess, the size of them. Yeah, and Vacation Bible School. Yeah, yeah. Vacation Bible School. Yeah, okay. Then 
we got the camp out coming up next month, which will be the 19th and 20th. It'll be a Friday mm -hmm. night Saturday, which is awesome. <laughs> Bitch! And then we bring the torch. Yeah. I've heard it. Yeah. I've heard it. And so we can have like, y'all can all bring the cake. Okay. Okay. Bring your snow. Let's <laughs> call it Mark's birthday party. Mark's birthday camp out. <laughs> Yeah. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Bless each and every one here, Lord. Bless my mom. She's going to go through what she has to do. 